brought up in conversation over the last couple of months. How do we approach something in Milton that's a little bit different? And the topic that we chose was taking care of business. In a lot of ways, Milton at Silton itself has evolved throughout the period of the 17th right through to the 21st century with little, if any, commercial development. But there were many industries here in Milton, some family-run, but some larger industries that actually contributed not only to a commercial tax basis, but were also important because they actually employed many local uh, residents in the different industries. Now, Milton itself is really a very close town to Boston itself. And seen here, these milestones were erected throughout the town in the 18th and early 19th century. This one at Milton Village is only about a, uh, a few hundred feet south of the bridge that connects Boston and Milton. But we would see that these mile markets themselves also demarked in some ways its proximity to the city and, of course, the many different industries that were located here. One of the ideas is that the Milton uh, side of the river called Milton Village itself would be developed in the period of the 17th century for commercial development as early as 1634. In that period, we saw that Israel Stoughton himself would actually establish what would become not only the first grist mill in New England, but to spur on water power that was used for many different industries. The Milton Village was also the site of the original location of the Suffolk Resolves House. And though most of us know it as that actually located at 1370 Canton Avenue, it was located at what is now the Citizens Bank in Milton Village. And seen here it was the home of Daniel Bowes, one of the merchants of Milton Village. He himself would actually live here throughout his lifetime. But it was also important because in 1774, the Suffolk Resolves was actually signed in this house, and Paul Revere would carry it on to Philadelphia, where it eventually became part of American history. But many people don't realize that though this residence was used for three generations of the family, it became a commercial structure by the latter part of the 1860s. And seen here in the early 20th century, it would evolve not only as a watch and clock repair company, but we would also see an electrical company, plumbing company, and also, as it says here, a cake shop. And by the period of 1950, when it was due to be demolished, it would be moved to Canton Avenue to be saved. But most of Milton Village itself was a mill village. It was an area where people lived and worked. And as we see here, William Stoughton, a portrait of the royal governor when he died in 1701, he himself had owned the Stoughton Grist Mill. But many of these different industries in this period of the 17th and 18th century were really quite intriguing. Benjamin Creehor himself not only lived in this small house, which is now roughly the 75 Adam Street, but he also on the first floor would produce it was thought to be the first piano forte in the United States. This actually is a rendering by John Riddle Penniman, but he would also invent the first American-made bass vial. And we realized that this concept of small industries in this period of time was an important feature, and that Milton Village didn't just have a craftsman making musical instruments, but his neighbor across the street, Mr. Swift, painted by Thomas Hughes Hinckley, was a man who made beaver hats. And in this little house, a little red house that stands full lawn in Milton Village, and probably one of the most endangered houses in Milton uh, preservation groups, is a great example of a small house that's called Swift's Hat Shop. And these wonderful tall hats themselves were made for close to 40 years for the gentry, not only of Milton, but throughout the Boston area. Well, in many ways, Milton Village itself, seen here by the turn of the 20th century, had given way from what were basically small houses to a more commercial aspect. On the right, the Associates building itself, designed by Roach and Tilden, when it was built in the 1880s, gave credence to this urban streetscape, so much so that the area itself today is primarily urban in concept. But we have to realize that many of these individual businesses that actually we'll speak about this evening are things that actually attracted not only many employees locally from both sides of the river, but also contributed heavily to what is basically the tax basis of Milton. The first is Baker's Chocolate my favorite. Baker's chocolate is something in a lot of ways that many people don't realize. It is the oldest manufacturer of chocolate in the United States. And it was founded by Dr. James Baker 
thanks to a fortuitous meeting with John Hammond. And in 1765, they began to produce chocolate on the banks of the Nahonset River with water power in a small wooden mill that was rented. And we saw in the period of 1780, it would later be incorporated as the House of Baker's Chocolate. But chocolate is a little bit different in the 18th and early 19th century than what we think of today. It wasn't a sweetened chocolate, it was a chocolate that would be combined with other ingredients to become palatable. But here in the period, we realized that Baker's itself throughout the early 19th century continued to expand, and that the old stone mill, designed by Gridley J. Fox Bryant, would be built on the Dorchester side of the Neponset River, and eventually give way to what became known as the Baker Mill. But the idea here was that it was Henry Pierce who was the man who would actually create not just a profitable concern, but also increase the company 40-fold. He took over the presidency of Baker's Chocolate in 1854, and by the time he died in 1896, he had two shifts of workers daily and a half day on Saturdays. He also parlayed what was basically a $3 a week county clerk salary into a fortune of $71 million when he died. He increased the size and scale and production of chocolate so much so that it wasn't just produced in Dorchester and Milton, but it would also be produced in Montreal. He also hired a series of architects, starting with Nathaniel Bradley, who designed the Pierce Mill, which is today residential apartments of the Milton complex. These buildings themselves would be designed for almost 30 years by the successor firm of Nathaniel Bradley, Winslow and Weatherall. And in some ways, it's probably the best preserved example of the mill industry in the entire Boston area. But it was also Henry Pierce that incorporated the trademark, La Belle Chocolatier. And seen here, she was a rendition of Das Chocolat and Navy, a pastel portrait that hangs in the Dresden Art Gallery that actually was used in 1883 as the official trademark. Well, Baker's was something in a lot of ways that not only produced a palatable uh, amount of chocolate, but it was also something in a lot of ways that people saw as an important feature of an employment factor. Not only did people work as chocolate makers and chocolate wrappers, but many women were employed as demonstrators. And seen here in a photograph of the 1950s, women would dress as the trademark come to life to actually serve chocolate, brownies, as well as cocoa to honored guests coming to the administration building. Well, in some ways, Baker's Chocolate by the period of the 1950s would have over 1,700 employees with three shifts daily. They had won a contract from the federal government of World War I and World War II providing chocolate for rations for the soldiers, both in the Allied forces. But seen here, one of the most important features was Baker's Cocoa. And this woman, actually Hazel Stanley is her name, is winning an award from Curtis Yeager, then president of Baker's Chocolate, because she filled her cocoa canisters faster than any other person in the history of Baker's Chocolate. In a lot of ways, we look at these people, the unsung heroes of people that made a profitable business, but they're an important feature of how it would evolve. And by the 1960s, here with the surface trolley passing by the silos on the River Street side of Baker's Chocolate, we realized that this was an industry that had gone through the guise of the Bakers and Pierces, and later through General Foods and now Kraft. But we realized that Baker's Chocolate was probably one of the most delicious as well as palatable industries in Milton. We'd also realized that some would actually think of Bent's as something not so much a cookie or a cracker, but one of the largest sandwiches that is served in the entire town of Milton. <laughs> Bent's, which is located on Pleasant Street today, had started in the early 19th century making what were basically water biscuits. A man by the name of Converse Francis, who was a minister in Medford, Massachusetts, had begun in the latter part of the 1790s to make water biscuits. These were things that could be baked and had a shelf life. If they didn't get wet, they actually stayed quite dry and had a shelf life of anywhere from a few months to actually until the time they were eaten. George Bent himself would actually start an industry in Milton that was actually derived from Deacon Samuel Adams. 
and in the upper portion of what is today Wadsworth Hill, Benz itself would produce in a small building enough water crackers that it would start a small industry that would actually increase in size and scale. Well, George H. Bench and Company actually had these water crackers. It also had this advertisement that said strictly handmade, but it was the genuine Bent cracker that was known and loved. It would later be incorporated into a much larger concern. Well, in the latter part of the 19th century, we began to realize that Bent's was not just a local industry. They had upwards of 35 employees, both men and women. And they also had delivery wagons that would connect Milton with Boston on a daily basis. And seen here outside of the building on Pleasant Street, this horse-drawn carriage, and if we go a little closer, shows that G.H. Benton Company's strictly handmade cold water crackers were available throughout the Boston area. Well, this was an important feature because right through to the period of World War I, these were still handmade. In this period, we had to realize that the women that would be employed would work at long booths and tables where they would actually hand cut these water crackers that were then transferred onto pallets to be baked in beehive ovens. And in this period of time, these beehive ovens would actually continue right up to the present. And here, Mr. Parati, who actually sold Benz recently, actually feeds the beehive oven with a peel and that the crackers themselves, once they were baked, had the shelf life that was necessary to keep them as a staple product. Throughout this period, so many crackers were made that the cracker ladies, and we see these women around a pile of water crackers, would sort them and bag them into bags that actually had a dozen or 24 per bag. It was an important feature because this was something that was not only enjoyed locally, but it would also be the fact that Benz would make hardtack, something that was known throughout the 19th century and today is enjoyed by many Civil War reenactors because of its authenticity. Benz also made parlays into cookies, and here the women themselves actually man these enormous tins that they themselves would then begin to actually place into smaller bags. And if you're so fortunate on a Saturday, you might too receive some of the broken cookies at a reduced rate. They're actually much better. But we also saw by the 1930s that no longer do they have horse-drawn delivery wagons, but Benz had begun to motorize, much like Baker's Chocolate had in the period of World War I. In this instance, these delivery trucks didn't just go to Boston, but they went to almost every major metropolitan city around the eastern seaboard. And we realized that Benz itself had become a very profitable concern. In a lot of ways, these were important. But we also saw different industries serving different types of food. Baker's chocolate is an important feature. Chocolate is known and loved for generations. And of course, Benz provided a staple product. But Copeland Cider and the Copeland Springs was an important feature in the latter part of the 19th century. For the Copeland family had had for generations a large tract of land of the Scots Wood section of Milton. Upper Randolph Avenue would be developed in the period of the 1900s, primarily for residential use, but the Copeland family had an area that would be open and used, as we would see, for farmland. But it would also be an important feature that the springs themselves would actually be used for sparkling russet, as well as even sparkling cider. Now, initially, Milton Springs themselves provided water, but in this period, C.L. Copeland himself would actually begin, in some ways, a new form, which was basically what we would call tonic or soda pop. Seen here, Ruth and Charles Copeland with their younger brother John in the period of the early 20th century would parlay their family's farm into what was to become one of the most attractive areas, not only with Newcomb Farms, but also with the Pepsi-Cola bottling and distribution company directly behind. In this period of time, they began to market their ginger ale, cider, and sparkling russet as what basically was used with the trademark Milton Springs. This was a paper label fortuitously acquired on eBay. And the idea in some ways was that these would actually be affixed to bottles. And the bottles came in many different colors. They weren't just clear, but some actually were beautiful bottle green. 
but every one of them had an imprint of a windmill. And the windmill was actually because of Windmill Hill, the area that they actually lived in, in the upper Randolph area, the Avenue area. But the idea here was that Charles Copeland himself continued to invest in a company that actually provided very enjoyable and refreshing drinks. Now the surprising thing was, it wasn't just enjoyed locally, it was enjoyed throughout the Boston area, but some stores actually catered to Charles Copeland, and one of them was a man by the name of John Carrigan. Now there's an area here in Milton called Carrigan's Corner, and Carrigan's Corner, as I was sitting at the traffic light this evening, is the corner of what is now Brook Road and um, Central Avenue. It's a house, but at the turn of the 20th century, this was a small wooden store where they actually sold ginger ale. And you see J.F. Kerrigan's name on the awning, but it said above, drink Milton Spring ginger ale. Well, this was available, and it was actually a very profitable place because it was across from the old Vaux School that later became Milton High School. So you had a built-in grouping of people that would actually enjoy this bottling company. Well, in a lot of ways, Copeland Springs themselves in the period of the 20th century saw the development of what was once the family farm into the development of the bottling and distribution company. But in the foreground, you'd actually, actually see in some ways these buildings themselves, such as the old tavern, becoming the headquarters of the Copeland Family Foundation. In a lot of ways, even though Copeland would have a farm that would eventually be developed for commercial purposes, they left their money in such a way that the Copeland Family Foundation benefits, not just Milton, though we're very fortunate that they did, but it was something that benefits the entire community at large. And in some ways, Copeland itself is something that started from a simple bottling can distribution company. And in the foreground here with the Newcomb Farms, maybe on a Sunday morning, you've actually enjoyed your half hour wait as you would wait a table at Newcomb's. Well, in a lot of ways, many of these things was important, but by the period of the 1960s, Charles Copeland himself and his wife would actually enjoy motoring around Milton. This was a photograph from the Tercentary Parade of 1962. They would actually dress in older clothing and actually go up and down the streets, not just in the parade, but also during the business week, to actually enjoy this idea of a different type and lifestyle. But they'd also see in some ways that this was an important feature for Broadway. There was also Thatcher Farm. And Thatcher Farm is an institution that still maintains itself to this day. It was founded in 1891, and we saw in some ways that Thatcher Farm itself was perpetuated, of course, by Thatcher Street. But it was an important feature because dairy farms were well known, not just in Milton, but throughout the area. And though there were once four individual dairy farms, Thatcher is the only one to survive to this day. This photograph of a watercolor done in the 1950s actually shows the area, not only with its silos, but the buildings themselves that front onto Thatcher Street. And it gave a little bit of a rendition of what this one family had done for what is basically five generations. Thatcher Farm itself had been founded by Alexander Manning, seen here in the upper left, and his wife in the foreground, Harriet Will Manning, and this was at the wedding of one of their sons at the Milton Hill House. And they themselves were an important feature because in 1891, much of what is today Wendell Park would be an open area where cows would actually be allowed to graze. And though there are no cows in Milton per se any longer, we realize that this was an important feature. And though this photograph comes from the collection of the Milton Historical Society and it can't actually be identified, I think, this is the area of Thatcher Farm with the cows in the early part of the 1920s. This was an important feature because a dairy farm was something that didn't just provide a sustenance here in the town, but they delivered throughout the metropolitan Boston area. And seen here, the Thatcher Farm milk wagons, along with their horses, were an important feature because home delivery, as it is today, was something 100 years ago that was taken for granted. But the Thatcher Farm Dairy itself was an important feature because it's something that actually has been maintained for over a hundred years. 
And when we think of Thatcher Farm, we have to realize that it's not just a family-run business, but it's also a business that people look at and get a good feeling. It's like Baker's Chocolate, or Ben Cracker, or Copeland. We look at this as an important feature here because not only with its trademark, but it showed it was convenient, it was quality, and served in glass bottles, something that's almost unheard of to this day. Here in the 1960s, we see the back of the farm itself. The building on the right-hand side actually does front onto Thatcher Street, and that is the building that was actually the office at one time. But this actually would be in the period throughout the 20th century of what was an open farm. And we even had some dairy cattle actually throughout the area with children and people in the background. And even though it was a dairy farm, you still even had tractors. And if you look closely, you might see Marita Cronin seated behind the wheel. It's important to realize that this might be typical of what you see evolving in Milton, of family roamed and operated businesses, in some ways continuing to this day in a part of the community. In some ways, even at the time of the tercentenary, they too participated in the parade, and it shows the Thatcher Farm milk wagon with the two people sitting behind the horse itself that would actually celebrate the 300th anniversary of the founding of the town of Milton. Today, of course, we see these trucks going up and down the streets of Milton. And as I was seated beside Tom Walsh tonight, I said, well, I guess nobody in Upper Canton Avenue gets Thatcher Farm milk. It must be the only part of the rich towns of Milton that gets it. We don't get it. <laughs> I look at Milton as a place in some ways that Thatcher Farm itself is available throughout the community, but in some ways it's an area that would actually be attractive. We also realize about Howard Johnson. Though Howard Johnson never had a store in Milton, he lived here for most of his adult life. Howard Johnson had been born in Quincy. He himself would eventually buy a house on Upper Brush Hill Road, later on Metropolitan Avenue. But he used as his trademark, Simple Simon of the Pineman. And in this way, it's an important feature of what became a food industry that was located throughout the Boston area. Howard Deering Johnson himself had been born in Wallston. He would eventually attend Quincy High School. And after graduation, he parlayed basically the idea of not only his marketing skills and his ability to actually serve quality foods, into what became one of the best ice cream stands in all of New England. In this period of time, he himself would serve ice cream that had the richest double butter fat count of any ice cream available. <laughs> it not only tasted good, but it was said to be the boss. At five cents a cone, it was something that was available almost to everyone. He had two shops, one on Wollaston Beach and eventually a second one in Dorchester, and he would actually serve his ice cream at these counters with hundreds of younger people throughout the summer months. It was said in two years he paid off a debt that had been accrued by his father eventually to open a store in 1929 in Quincy Square. But Howard Johnson himself would also develop what became known as the 28 Flavors. And this ice cream itself was an important feature. It not only tasted good, it was affordable, but it also had a wide panoply of flavors for almost every palate. Howard Johnson's would also develop a typical restaurant, and this was architect designed, and this is a postcard of the Canton store that was on Route 138. The building itself had a garish orange roof and blue shutters, as his daughter said. It was attractive because almost every automobile that passed by these buildings couldn't help but see the orange roof as they approached. But it was actually to cater to the automobile traffic, and Howard Johnson himself made a fortune marketing his orange roofed restaurants. He would also begin to franchise his business, and his franchise was an important feature because he eventually got money from people who would buy the franchise. But the fortunate thing was, he never really sold the total franchise. He might have sold the building, the property that had to be designed by his architect, but he also made the franchise actually the uh, 
dependent on him because he provided the food, and that way he could control the quality and cost. His recipes themselves would be printed into a wonderful menu, and this is from the late 1930s, but it was an important feature because during this period of time, Howard Johnson himself only served high quality food, such as Ipswich clams, as well as even ice cream. And these floats themselves with Ipswich clams were probably quite delicious until about 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> but Howard Johnson himself parlayed his franchise business into something that was up and down the East Coast and available almost in every major city. Well, in a lot of ways, when you look at children smiling, and one has an ice cream sundae, another a float, and the other an ice cream cone, you realize that Howard Johnson himself would later sell his mansion on Brush Hill Road and buy a house on Metropolitan Avenue. The house on Metropolitan Avenue was quite large, and it was rumored that because of taxes, he removed the second story and created a mansard roof, so he was only taxed for a one-story house. But this man would also live in a Park Avenue duplex as well as on Martha's Vineyard. And during this period of time, he had parlayed his investment into something that was quite important. What do you do with all of these different food industries? It goes the gamut of Baker's Chocolate, Ben's Crackers, Thatcher Farm Milk, as well as even Howard Johnson's Ice Cream. But enjoy it in a diner. Well, maybe you're too young to remember, but Barr's Diner was on Granite Avenue in East Milton for many years. And Barr's Diner was a place that attracted not just people walking, but also automobile traffic. And Barr's Diner was an important feature on the interior. You would actually see people on a daily basis. But the diner itself would provide home-cooked meals as well as wonderful desserts, along with almost everything that we've seen earlier. And in a lot of ways, Bar's Diner is a great example of something that no longer survives for having once served so many different aspects of the food industry in Milton. But when we look at this, we begin to realize that this is only a small segment of commercial development in Milton throughout the period of the 18th and 19th century. And in some ways, each of these individual industries were an important feature they not only provided employment, but they also provided a commercial tax basis. And though we as a community look at commercial encroachment as something that isn't always advantageous, it has always been here. And in a lot of ways, we look at this food industry as a great way of not only celebrating the annual meeting of the Milton Historical Society, but also reflecting on the many industries that helped make our community great. Thank you very much. Hey. give you one little uh, comment tonight. I don't know if you know, but I've been writing the history of Baker's Chocolate now for two years. I feel like I'm living the land of Baker's Chocolate. Over the last year, I have tasted everything from chili chocolate to vanilla chocolate to cho chocolato, and I've gained 70 pounds. <laughs> I look at chocolate as something that is not just delicious, but it's also something in a lot of ways that this book will chronicle the history of a company that in many ways most of us realize how important it truly was. Well, over the last year I've been writing to Kraft Family Foods, asking permission to use the trademark Lavelle Chocolatier in the book. And over the last six to seven months, with no response whatsoever, I began to call every other day and leave messages. So after about a month of messages, which to that tune was about 15, I finally got an email from an attorney from Kraft, and they asked exactly what I wanted. So I pulled out all of my letters and emails, and I said I'd like to use the trademark, La Belle Chocolatier, in my book on the history of Baker's Chocolate. And she said, well, could you email me a photograph of what you'd like to use? I said, of course. So the next morning at my office, rather than sitting down to do accounting, I emailed Kraft and I sent them La Belle Chocolatier. Within the day, I had an answer. And I looked at this at 4 o'clock and I said, oh, I finally got an answer. And it said I could not use La Belle Chocolatier in my book on the history of Baker's chocolate. 
But I thought to myself, I couldn't possibly say that. So I printed it out. I'm not green, by the way. I reread the email and it said, you can't use La Belle Chocolatier in your book. Well, two years ago, I might have reacted differently, but I sat down and I emailed Dresden Art Gallery in Germany. And I said to a curator in an email, I need a copy of Das Chocolaten Maiden, the pastel portrait in your collection for a book on chocolate. It arrived tonight. <laughs> and rather than having La Belle Chocolatier in the book, the Milton Historical Society will be featuring Das Chocolaten Maiden. So, hopefully. It'll be. Have any questions or comments? Please. When is the book published? My photographs are due in ten days. The text is due in one month, and the book should be out October first. which was built by Vegas Chocolate in 1902. The wooden building directly behind it was actually Dr. Ware's Chocolate Mill. Surprisingly, there were four manufacturers of chocolate in Dorchester and Milton in the 19th century. Vegas, Preston's, Dr. Ware, and Webb and Twombly. That was the Ware Chocolate Mill. Yes, please. Uh, chocolate seems like an incongruous product before Baker's chocolate began to produce it. Cacao beans were brought in from the West Indies, they were brought in from South America. They were known and they were actually made into what was basically a crude form of chocolate. It was even known in the early part of the 18th century. Chocolate was something that had been known, but it was a different substance. Whereas we enjoy sweet chocolate, this was a savory chocolate and it would only be the fact that they would add sugar to it to sweeten it to become cocoa. Previous to that time, it was called chocolate or cacao. And the idea in that instance was that even in Boston, chocolate was known. But it was in the period of the mid 18th century that chocolate took on new heights when actually it was a sweetened drink that was enjoyed in the afternoon, much like people would enjoy tea in the 19th century. It seems incongruous because it only grows in warm climates but it was something that was a luxury that was known by many different people in the 18th century, even in Boston and Milton. Yes? Does anybody remember the delicious odor of chocolate when it used to cook it? The question was, does anyone remember the aroma of chocolate? <laughs> I think in many ways, after about seven days of it, it would actually permeat almost everything. But chocolate is something in a lot of ways that's part of our history, but so too is in Ben's Cracker and Copeland Farms and Thatcher Farms. And also, as we see here with Baker's Chocolate, it's an important feature. Everyone adds to it. So in a way, I hope you have actually enjoyed this little slide lecture, but it gives you a little bit more of an idea of what Milton Historical Society enjoys and hopes you too do and what we try to preserve. Thank you very much. Thank you.